Thanks, brother. Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to sort of kind of land the jet with you all. Thanks for staying for the morning. Uh, it's, uh, how many of you are flying out before 11 o'clock? Okay, we got, we got a handful of people I noticed on the board that are, that are just heading out early. So when you do, we will be sure to uh, bless you, you know, with some sort of, uh, you know, sarcastic comment as you're walking out the door. <laughs> Hope you enjoy the heck out of that. Um, let me just give you a sense of what we're going to be doing in these couple hours that we're going to have together. Um, we're going to just do a quick, maybe five-minute wrap-up of yesterday for the folks that were together yesterday, just in terms of this whole vision of uh, sustainable youth ministry. Then um, we're going to talk about this whole topic of building sustainable teams. Now, now some, those, of, those of you that were with me yesterday know that I'm, I'm putting out this $100 bet. The $100 bet is... Uh, I've got a process for you to recruit your volunteers, and if it doesn't work, I'll pay you $100. You, all you have to do is work this process. If it doesn't work, you just call me, no questions asked, I'll send you $100. Um, I've never had to pay, but you could be the first, and it would be very educational for me. It would be worth $100. So uh, just, uh, just know that's, that's sort of what's coming as we're talking about the recruiting process. Um, but fundamental to building a sustainable team is being a sustainable leader ourselves. So before we dive into the process of building teams, uh, we're going to just do a little bit of uh, messing around in the whole world of the emotionally healthy youth worker. Um, and <laughs> some of you started twitching when I said such a thing. Um, uh, uh, let me just give you a quick story to, uh, to illustrate why, why that's important, particularly in my life. I started out in youth ministry at 19 years old, just three or four years ago, and uh, uh, thank you, those of you that thought that was funny, um, uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, working in a, in a church in, in Waco, Texas, and uh, uh, I was 19, the, uh, the youth pastor was, uh, are you going to bring that over here? That's beautiful. Uh, the youth pastor was uh, the ripe old age of 23, I was, I was his assistant, and uh, we... Uh, uh, we would go on these mission trips. And this was before like, things like child protection policies and those sort of things. And so it was essentially, it was me and the 23-year-old veteran, uh, and uh, along with maybe two or three adults and a busload of kids. And uh, the youth director and I were the bus drivers. And so we drove down from, from Waco to Mexico, I don't know, 10 hours or so, uh, crossing the border back and forth. And... Uh, uh, I, I, remember, uh, I remember bringing, bringing a little chair before we left. I went into the church and went into the, you know, kind of the, the little kid area and got one of those little chairs and put it right, right next to the, the driver's seat, you know. <laughs> Who cares about the gear shift that's right here? Um, uh, but put it right next to the driver's seat so uh, I could just kind of have, a, a, my, my commitment on that trip was to have a one-on-one -on -one with every kid. I wanted, to, I wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one sort of challenging, take it to the next level conversation with every kid. So I'd kind of invite them up one at a time. I said, what's going on with the Lord? And I'd, I'd sort of, you know, drive them a little bit forward, just a little bit, little bit of challenge. And, uh, and so we, we got there to the place we're staying in Mexico. And, uh, and I, you know, we, our schedule said for us that we we're going to start by having quiet time at 6.30 and then get on with our day, you know, because it gets hot later in the afternoon. So we're starting our day early, going to have a quiet time at 6.30. Well, I uh, was pretty committed that I felt like there are a few kids that were ready to take it to the next level. And so I invited those kids to join me on a run at 530, because um, you know when you're on a mission trip, you need exercise. Um, so I invited those kids to join me on a, a 530 run. Of course, I wanted to have my quiet time before the, the weenies had their quiet time. So I had mine at five. And so I, I, was, I was up at five, maybe, maybe a little bit earlier. And uh, then when we'd, we'd kind of go through our day, and after the end of the day, we'd come back and have a program, and, and at, the, at the end of the program, we'd uh, come back, and then, uh, you know, i try to have a couple one-on-ones with kids, trying to help them, you know, take it to the next level, right? So, um, so, so I'm starting at about five every morning, finishing up about midnight every night, and, uh, and uh, you know, I think we're making some progress here. There's some kids that are about to take it up, you know, step it up a notch. And uh, so we get, to the, we get to the last day of the week. 
And, and oh, in our program time, we're sort of at a park doing a little outreach with community kids in a park. And, but before we have dinner at the park, we play a little full contact football because you need exercise when you're on a mission trip. So we're playing full contact football every night. <clears throat> and every night, um, as, we're, as we're lining up, there's a guy across the, across the line from me who uh, is about maybe two, 220, pretty, pretty stocky, uh, about 6'2", which is, you know, you may not have noticed, but maybe, maybe slightly larger than me. And, uh, and so the, every, 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 every game, it's getting a little bit more intense, and he's, he's you know, kind of running over me just about every, just about every game. And uh, so we, uh, the last night of the event, um, we're having some, you know, had some great ministry time, and we're playing a little full contact football. And I line up on the line. Remember, I've got probably a total of 25 hours sleep at this point uh, in a week. I line up on the line, and, uh, and he plows into me. And I, I invo- you ever have involuntary facial gestures? I have this involuntary lip quiver. Starts doing some of this. And I, and I, uh, and he looks at me with a, uh, you know, an, a nice encouraging, hey, just, you know, you can calm down. He says, uh, he says, you know, I'm going to hit you again, don't you? So I line up. You were playing with the kids, right? This is, this is all about the kids. I, I line up. The ball snaps, but it's not the only thing. I come across the line in Christian love. <laughs> Just swinging at this guy across the line from me. I'm 19 years old. Spiritually, I mean, I've taken it to the next level. <laughs> and uh, now the fortunate thing is it wasn't a kid. It wasn't a, it wasn't a volunteer leader. <laughs> it was my boss. <laughs> it was my 22-year-old boss there. 23. Uh the tragedy of that story is that it took me 10 years to realize that that was my problem. I, I thought he was just a jerk for 10 years after that. I, as I told the story, the narrative was, what a, what a jerk that guy was. Uh, y'all have seen the movie The Blind Side, right? The whole notion of the blind side lineman is that the blind side lineman covers the blind side. And I'm afraid that most of us in ministry don't have a blindside lineman protecting our blindside. And most of us in youth ministry spend 95% of our time with people that are more stupid than we are. (laughs) And we're not going to get smarter, we're not going to get deeper by doing the same thing and surrounding ourselves with people that are not going to help us move forward. And one of the things I've discovered about youth pastors is is that we often love to isolate ourselves so that we're the smartest person in the room. If we are going to grow in in leading a team, the first thing about leading a great team is we got to learn to be self-aware. we got to learn to know our blind spots, know our blindness. So I'm going to mess with that just a little bit. Um, And uh, I would like to say that was the last time I had ever discovered a blind spot, but they're pretty much, uh, again, the research has been done. Basically, one out of one of us has those. And, and um, unfortunately, um, we often are so busy with the work of ministry that we are too busy to surround ourselves with coaches. There's only one kind of person that has coaches, really, and that's a champion. I don't have a coach for my running, which is why I run at a 12 and a half minute pace. Uh, Olympians have coaches. If we want to be if we want to be exceptional at what we do, whether it's our marriage, our parenting, our walk with Christ, our ministry, if we want to be exceptional at what we do, there's a good chance we're going to need to have coaches. And uh, so we'll, we'll dive into that in just a minute. So, um, because I've already taken half of the time together. Oh, let me tell you about this quick link here. Uh, this was a reminder for me to tell you about the link. Um, I've got it. I've got a, a form here and on my phone too, if you'd rather do that. But Essentially, when, when we do, any of our team does a, a presentation, we offer to the folks there this, um, this online assessment that you can do for your ministry. Uh, if, you, if you go to our website, you have to pay for it. But if you use this link, you just, you just go to that link 
and, and you can put in your information. Essentially, it gives you a quick online assessment. You can get a quick picture of what's going on in your ministry. And, uh, and then typically one of us will, will follow up with you and we can, you know, we'll have a little 10, 15 minute conversation about it. So if you're interested in that, that's the website. If, you, if you'd rather not go to that link, I've got, I plugged in my iPad and have that form here. You could just type it into my, into my iPad. Speak lips. Uh, okay, I, I believe it's one of those three. <laughs> I've gone ahead and narrowed that down for you, and you can you can laboratorize that, and you know just you know it's okay if you fail the first few times. It's it's gonna it's gonna be all right. Um, but if you can't find it, uh, yeah, if if you can't find it, uh, you can just come up here, or I can email it to you. Actually, let me just give you in case you need it. My email address is mark at ministryarchitects.com. Feel free, you can say, hey, DeVries, that link didn't come through, and um, we can talk about it. Um, yeah, yeah, one of the primary metaphors we've been using to talk about the work of building a sustainable ministry is this image of building a dance floor. So those of you that haven't been with us, uh, we may refer to the dance floor, uh, and, and much of that dance floor has to do with building a, a sustainable team. So we're, uh, here's, a, here's just a quote from Ed Freeman, who I mentioned yesterday, wrote this book, Generation to Generation. Here's, here's this introduction to the systems approach. When one part of an organism is treated in isolation from its interconnections with another, as though the problem were solely its own, fundamental change is not likely. Remember we talked yesterday about the addict in, in an addictive family. All the focus goes on that person as if it's only that person's problem. And when that happens, we often, th that system stays stuck and that person stays stuck. The symptom is likely to is, is, to, is apt to recycle in the same or different form in the same or different member. Trying to cure a person in isolation from his or her family is as misdirected and ultimately ineffective as transplanting, I love this metaphor, as transplanting a healthy organ into a body whose imbalanced chemistry will destroy the new one as it did the old. It's easy to forget that the same family of organs that rejects a transplant contributed to the originally diseased part becoming foreign. Um, so we're just, we're thinking... Uh, Often when a youth pastor is brought in, the idea is it's all the youth pastor's responsibility. And they bring all of the skill that they have learned about dancing, all the skill they have learned about ministry, but they often don't tend to the system or the dance floor. And that's what we've been working on this weekend. Um, I want to give you this little clip and give you a little bit of time to talk about what are the systems embedded in this clip, all right? <laughs> people, don't just drink your coffee today. Let it fill you. Let it inspire you. Try an Americana, a mocha latte, even a cappuccino with its rich and satisfying body. Now, I want to remind everyone, don't forget our goal of converting 500 people to coffee. Remember, bring your non-coffee drinking friends with you. Drag them here if you have to. Buy them a scone even. Just get them here. Because remember... Coffee is good all the time. We feel that secret in coffee shops. 
Last year alone, we had 75 new coffee drinkers, 75 new customers. We're not like those guys down the street that water their product down. We serve nothing but 100% pure coffee. Coffee is so important in everyday life, it's more important than air. Hey, how are you doing? What are you there for you today? Uh, I think you just want some coffee. You've never been here before, have you? No. Um, excuse me, if this is your first time visiting with us, would you go ahead and raise your hands? We would love to welcome you. <laughs> 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 we would love to get some information about you so we can follow up with you. If you could go ahead and fill this out, we'll be able to get things started. Oh, and when you bring those back to us, we'll have a special gift just for you. I just want some coffee. Uh, you can just go ahead and sit right over there to fill those out. That'd be great. Thank you. Look at the coffee. Well, you. you know, some people go skydiving. I serve people coffee. It's a rush. I love it. I put my heart and soul into that coffee. There's nothing like seeing somebody take a sip of coffee for the first time in their life. We get a lot of visitors coming through. Not always do they come back, but deep down inside, I know a bean's been planted. Some people just can't take it this stuff. Thank you, Barista Mark. It's so good to see everyone at the International <laughs> Morning First Starbucks of the Northern Valley. And I want to draw our attention to the tip jar. <laughs> right out of college, I learned that I could combine giving to my barista with my coffee, and this is the result. I found out that when I gave, my coffee came back to me, pressed down, shaken together, and running out all over. And I was a changed man. It's because the word joy, J-O-Y, means Java, others, and you. And we <laughs> National Coffee Day. National Coffee Day is coming up, you know. It's always a big day for us, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send out a direct mailer, and I'm sure our attendance is going to more than double, and it's going to change everything. And then in two weeks, we're going to be serving coffee great to the homeless. And you're not going to want to miss that. What can I get you today? I think I just want some coffee. Okay. That'll be three ninety-eight. Oh, hey, what did you want to drink? Sir. Thank you. Oh, I almost forgot. Your special gift for being a first time visitor. Maybe Jamie Jones is gone. So so we'll see you next week, right? Yeah. Alright. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as you uh as you think about what you saw there. <laughs> Uh, what, what were the systems, what were the systems that were in place there? They had greeters, yeah. They had announcements, right? They had the connect card, right? Yeah. What else? Yeah, there was a you know there was a sharing time or an offering or something. You you get the idea. There were there were in in all of our churches there are systems, and typically you remember uh, the quote I gave you yesterday from Mark chapter seventeen. Anybody remember? Mark chapter seventeen verse one. Anyone? Nothing works, right? Y'all can y'all can look that up later. Um, nothing works. And for us to assume that the system we put in place is going to work. So we had a system for greeters. And you know what? I'll bet they had a really nice job description. And I'll bet it said, don't stand at the door and talk about Julius Jones. But something happened in the system. There was the assumption that, well, if we got a system, it, it should just automatically work. Um, it, as we're thinking about this whole systems approach and especially about volunteers. I am blown away how often point youth leaders are surprised that their volunteers don't do exactly what they expect. Now, those of you that have, have been a point youth leader in your church, how many of you have ever had a leader that you recruited and they said yes, and then they didn't do exactly what you expected? Okay, it looks like a charismatic church now. That, um, <laughs> 
Um, so so part, of, part of a systems approach is not just creating systems, but continually tending to them and tuning them up. Um, if, if youth ministry were a car, it would be like we get the car and we drive it. We never, we never do an oil change. We never put gas in it. And we just assume it ought to run and then we get really mad. And uh, now the truth is, most of us are really busy going somewhere in our ministry car. And we don't have time for nonsense like stopping to fill up the gas tank. Right? And so what happens? We run out of gas. And if there's one thing, uh, <laughs> one thing you don't see a lot of in youth ministry is old youth pastors. Because there is something about this work that is a grind. And if we don't take time to step back, take care of, the, take care of this thing we've been given, this, the gift of ministry we've been given, chances are we're not going to be in the game for long. That, that is my hope for you, not just as we talk about a ministry that lasts beyond the tenure of an individual. I want to talk about uh, people who last in ministry and don't become jaded and cynical about the church just because they get old. That still have as much joy and life and love for the church as they did when they started. That's not going to happen accidentally. It's not going to happen because we jump on the conveyor belt of do what you got to do in youth ministry. Now, let me tell you, I am in a situation right now where I return back to my church on August 1st, 2016, and my plan is to spend the rest of my life volunteering to say thank you to what the church has done for me and my family. Uh, I am so, uh, there, there are certain things I don't want to do anymore, but there are plenty of things I can continue to do with great joy. And so... Um, just a, a quick a couple slides to remind us of where we were yesterday. In the systems approach, these are the things that were a few of the kind of key things that every uh, ministry needs to tend to in terms of control documents. Um, now, because this is a little bit unusual, uh, the directory is, is too easy to gloss over. So let me, let me give you a little bit of complexity, Kirk. Where's Kirk? Okay, how you doing, brother? You good? Ad, Adam, Adam says hi. Um, so, um, uh, in, in your directory, you've got, uh, uh, you've got seven different kinds of, of students in your directory, and you often treat most of them exactly the same, which is why you go through this purge experience and you throw out the elder's uh, child as quickly as you threw out the kid from Des Moines who came one time to the lock-in three years ago. So, let me tell you about the, the seven kind of kids you've got as you're creating your directory. The simple way to think about this is an Excel spreadsheet and every kid's got a code, one of these seven codes. It really helps you with your follow-up. So here we go. You got your member active kids, your visitor active kids. Your member active kids are kids who have either joined the church themselves, been, been through confirmation or uh, been baptized or whatever it is, or their families are members of the church. And we've seen them in my, you, you form it however you want, but in my system, You've seen them once in the last year. They have made some effort at being a part of the life of the church, even if it's just once in the year. The visitor active kids is a little more intuitive. These are kids that have, are not, their families are not members, they are not members, but they're an active part of the group. When you create your directory, this is all you put in your directory. You're going to have at least as 30% uh, more names on this list than are in your directory. And this is where we all get tripped up. Uh, your next group is called the MIA group. What would that stand for? Or member inactive. But either one of them works, right? These are kids who are a part of the church family. They are ours. We took baptismal vows for them or their family has joined the church. Uh, but they're the ones we often lose. I generally think two times a year, a two-time-a-year check-in, as, as I mentioned yesterday with your MIA kids, that about covers it. So let's just say you got 40 MIA kids. You pull that list, first week of January, first week of July, and you send a postcard, you call the mom and dad, you send a Facebook post, you're just connecting with them. Nothing will get you fired quicker than ignoring kids that, that are a part of the church. If you ignore them for three or four years, there will be uh, people who say, 
they never once reached out to my kid. I've been a part of this church all my life, and they never, never once reached out. They don't have to come, but you have to stay connected. Um, that's your follow-up list. Well, actually, let me speak to me, Lips. Any of that, sure. Um, Sometimes, at at least once a year, I would say their parents need to know that you have tried to contact them. There are two ways to do that that I know of. You call the home phone, which nobody ever answers, or you, and you just say, hey, I'm calling for Johnny, it's Bill from church, and just want you to know we're thinking about you and praying for you, and if there's anything we can do, let us know. That's great. Or you call the parent and say, you know, we know it's been a while, we we haven't really created a program that, that really is is drawing the interest of Johnny, but uh, we'd love to do anything we can. You got any advice for us? That works. Um, it, can be a, it can be a quick text. Hey, I, I saw that you uh, sang, uh, your, your ensemble sang uh, at the Chamber of Commerce last week. I heard great comments about it. Hope you're doing great. Love you. Yeah, whatever, any kind of, but the, the idea is we want to be able to say to the elders, and you want your senior pastor to be able to say to the elders, yeah, that's just a part of our system. Every kid gets contacted a couple times a year. Any of that. Uh, the other one that requires some follow-up, and probably the most follow-up, is a group called First Timers. These are folks that, um, that are visitors, but they're sort of, if you're a car salesman, this is your lead book. These are, these are folks that, that have, they're not enough active that you put them in visitor active, but they're not inactive enough that you say, we don't need to follow up with them anymore. So sometimes the first-timers can stay on your list for five years. You're just continuing to... to so you, uh, if you're going to follow up ideally with this group, every, not, not every kid, but you're looking at your first-timer list every week, right? Um, this kind of... If, if you want to keep some freshness and aliveness or something about new folks stepping into your ministry, that helps, helps create some momentum and energy. Um, so... This is, this is just the process for the kids that show up. There's a whole other process for getting kids to show up, but this is just when they show up, what are you going to do to keep things interesting for them? Then you have the visitor inactive kids, you have the changed churches kids, and you have the out-of-town kids. And now, sometimes the out-of-town kids belong up here, um, but your visitor inactive kids, they require zero follow-up. Um, these are kids that they came with their cousin, they're the, the daughter of the rabbi at the church down the street, they're, whatever. But you have made the decision, we're not going to do any more follow-up with that. I just want you to be deliberate about the kids you're going to drop. And what we typically do is say, if I hadn't seen them in three years, I'm dropping them. Now, you just don't want to do that with this kind of group, but you can name them visitor inactive, no more follow-up. Change churches, these are kids that have, um, that have their family said, we now go to a different church. And this group out of town, this is if you got a kid in boarding school or you got a kid that is, you know, in the school year in California, but they're in your town in the summertime or they live with their grandparents every now and then. They're a part of the group, but they're out of town. So you might, you're going to follow up with them maybe once a year, if at all. If you can isolate this group out, it helps you tend to the folks you want to isolate. I mean, that you really want to target. Yeah. Absolutely, he's member active, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, you may want to pull some of those kids out to, because you feel like they need some special attention. You feel like you want to follow up with them. So sometimes under member active, you create a whole other category called worship-only kids, and you, and you pursue those. Um, yeah. Um, I, I would, all of these, all of these uh, kids stay on your database. Uh, you don't get, data is like matter, it never disappears. It just moves to a different form, all right? Your changed churches kids, they just move on to a list. 
the, the, all you're looking for is what kind of follow-up do we want to be doing? If the parent says, we're now going to a different church, you move them to change churches and you let that church have oversight for them. It, it might, you know, you can create your own process however you want. Um, if they come back, they might become a first-timer again and you start pursuing them like a first-timer. Yeah. Um, now, that's, that's more complicated uh, than most people think of when they think of a, a directory. But if you can begin to manage your database, you can target your promotion, your mailing, so you're not sending these kids the invitation to play dodgeball every Saturday afternoon. Yeah. Um, I would get a guy in an apron with some letters on it that don't make any sense. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we typically, in our whatever gatherings we've got, whether it's a small group or a, or a Sunday school class, we will have in that small group just the, the leader say, hey, we'd love for you to fill out a contact card. Um, we, we promise to send you lots of junk mail. Um, so, you know, we try to make it funny. Uh, I'm sure there are, there are better ways to do it, um, but, you know, we don't typically get much resistance to that. But it allows, it allows the kids that don't want to do it, if they don't want to turn it in, fine. But it does allow that kid who wants to become an active part of the ministry to say that on the card somewhere, and then we can be more eager about following up. But, yeah, the, my experience with, with gathering that information is that it's, it's usually awkward, um, but it's, it's usually worth the risk as well. Which is why most companies will pay, you know, 10 bucks a name for, for you just to go on their, li- their online. They'll give you something free just so you give them an email address. Because it's, it's difficult to do. So, um, so I'm just, I'm just laying this before you as uh, part of the architecture. We start with control documents, not visioning documents. Um, uh, these are visioning documents. Uh, a mission statement, goals, values, structure document. This is, this is more complex stuff, and in fact, let's be honest, you can run a fine and healthy ministry without all of these written. Um, if you want to have sort of a, a steady drumbeat of ministry that you're, everybody's singing off the same page, we feel like a mission statement and values are absolutely essential. We feel like having goals that you say, this year, these are the three things we want to accomplish. Pretty helpful stuff. Um, we walk through a, a three-day visioning process with churches that we work with, and um, it's a, it, it can be pretty intense uh, if you're trying to do it yourself. My recommendation is try to do all this stuff. And if you need some help, you, you, that you get somebody, ministry architects or somebody else, to come in and kind of help you moderate that process because sometimes you just need a, a little help, a little push to get over the hill. Um, then we, we like to talk about this whole notion of revisioning You start a new vision, a new youth director comes, new youth pastor comes, you get this increased momentum, and the time to make a decision about a new trajectory is before you've reached that peak. And most of the time, we most of the time we don't want to prune things that are growing. But if you know anything about gardening, you know you've got to prune the good stuff. I I remember we started growing a little garden in our yard. And, and we had, they, there were like two or three, you know, vegetable plants growing right next to each other. And the, the book said, we need to prune, we need to pick all but one and give them three inches around them. I, I didn't want to do that. I, that felt like I was limiting things. I, I wanna, I'm going to let them all grow. And what happens? They choke each other out and none of them really grow. Um, so, so pruning is one of the key pieces of growing, and often we don't want to start a new thing when things are working. The time to begin to think about what's the next chapter, what's God calling us to the next, what's the next hill, is, is before we've hit that hill. But typically, we don't like to do that. We just like to ride the momentum. We like to ride the conveyor belt. And then we, it, it eventually peaks. It always does. comes down here, and that's when most youth workers leave. And then this is actually not accurate. It's more like down here. And then the new person comes and they pick up something that's stalled in the water and you've got to start all over again. Um, so as we're thinking about uh, the visioning process, we're not just thinking about what's our sort of permanent vision, but for the next three or four years, what's the thing we're, we're trying to lean into? Given our unique context, given the unique challenges we're facing right now, what's this new thing? 
Maybe a good business metaphor for that is, you know, Apple just has done this beautifully. Um, when everybody was loving the iPod, they came out with this iPhone. Nobody really wanted it until it came out. Then you, did you, do you remember seeing the big news thing about uh, Steve Jobs is rolling out this iPad? If you were like me, you looked at that and thought, what in the world? Who would ever use that? So it's not like you're waiting for the demand for, for kids to say, you know what I'd really love to do is I'd really love to be a part of a really profound student leadership program where I'm being discipled and challenged and launched out into independence in Christ. And I, The demand is not going to come. You're going to say, what does it feel like God's calling us to at this, at this juncture of our ministry, right? Okay, here we go. Here's where we begin with sustainable teams. Uh, you all may remember JetBlue. There was a guy that... I'll let him tell you about it. Oh, sorry. Now, y'all have had some incredible worship this week, but you're going to go home singing this song. <laughs> you get on the plane. I'm, I'm so sorry. Have you, ever ha- have you ever said these words? I'm done. And, and sometimes it's hard to tell between what is something that causes us to be done and what is just the battery going out on our wireless mouse. Um, when we are not tending to our own hearts, and incidentally, Proverbs 4.23, y'all know this, we a lot of times use it in Bible studies, tell kids not to have sex. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart. Think of all the things the scripture could say above all else about. Love God with all your heart. Above all else, love your neighbor as yourself. Above all else, but instead, the writer of Proverbs says, above all else, 
guard your heart. That is not insignificant. Because if we are not guarding our heart, we can't do those other things. We can't love God with all our heart because it's like it's going through a poison stream. Right? Um, and so, um, one of the easiest things for us to do when we are in a mess in our, our ministries, and, uh, you know, some people have a mess uh, once every three months. Some people have a mess once every three minutes. But we all have a mess. Uh, we can decide to pull back from, you know the story of the jet blue guy, right? The, oh, there was this, this, I don't know, 10 years ago, this jet blue flight attendant, people were being rude to him, and he said, I'm done. And while they're on the tarmac, before they ever, you know, are, are taken off, uh, he says, I'm done. He opens the emergency room door, throws it out, takes the chute, grabs a couple beers, and slides down the chute. Right? <laughs> Y'all don't know this story. Unbelievable. Yeah? Um, but we often have the jet blue syndrome. When it comes to ministry, because there are times when it ju it's just more than we can handle. Now, I think sometimes it's harder for women than men in this regard because women are told that to tend to your own heart is selfish and you need to serve. And why in the world are you worrying about yourself when you sh Right? Now, I think guys have a different kind of trouble with it. I, I can handle it myself. I don't... I don't until it just becomes so high that we start slugging people around us, literally or figuratively. Um, so in this little section, I want, you, I want you to just dive in a little bit to this whole emotional health thing. Uh, you know the Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. What's the part of, of the Shema that you remember? What sticks out to you? I'm, I'm going to see if you can remember the part that everybody forgets. What's in there? You with me? Deuteronomy 6? It's the Bible. Deuteronomy, yeah, okay, love the Lord your God with all your, what else, yeah? Impress these things upon your children, yeah, yeah, yeah? Yeah, and it says in between, love the Lord your God. No, this is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament, right? If there were football games in the Old Testament, there would be a guy with a big, <laughs> right? This is it, this is on the mezuzah in an Orthodox Jewish house, they kiss it on the way in, this is it. Sums up the whole Old Testament right here. Love the Lord your God. Impress these things on your children. And the hinge point is these things must be on your heart. Don't take the next step of impressing them on, the ch on your children unless they're on your heart. Part of what I love about the rhythm of this week for you guys is that it's not just about content, 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 content. But there's a lot of space for stuff to resonate in your heart. Um, you know, my, both of my parents are in assisted living now, and so I spend some time in rooms of people who are in assisted living and have, have downsized their life from a big house into, you know, whatever, 300 square feet. And most of them take all their treasures and fill their room with their, you know, their silver, you know, tea service or whatever they got. And you know what it looks like? Clutter. All that treasure looks like clutter because there's no space around it. And one of, the, one of the invitations, I think, that Jesus kept giving his disciples who were all like, hey, Jesus, dude, we got we to we go. We gotta, we gotta, I mean, these people want to hear from you. What do, what do you, what do you let's, let's, go, let's go hear them. You know, it's kind of this, you know, a little chihuahua. Come on, let's go, Jesus. We got to go, go help people. And Jesus said, ah, you know what? Let's go to these other towns nearby. I'm going to go there. Wait a second, wait a second. Well, we've got a whole crowd of people that are ready for you. We've got, I mean, we got stuff to do. We can, I mean, you can do a book signing. It's just going to be awesome. We're just going to, right? And there is something about stepping into that barren place, the empty place. When we go to, you step into a cathedral, part of what creates a sense of awe is what? The space, right? Um, well, I love this line from Thomas Merton. We're not very good at recognizing illusions, least of all the ones we cherish about ourselves. Um, so we're going to, uh, I'm going to name a few things that keep, us, that keep us stuck. This is a little bit of review. Um, the first one is, 
uh, this is personally not in our ministries. We did our ministries yesterday. When we focus on the issue rather than the system, yesterday we talked about the difference between content thinking and systems thinking. When we focus on an issue like um, changing the time of Sunday night youth group. I, I, I've had, we've, been, we've been invited into work at churches for you know, issues as profound as we really need to hire a consultant for a year to help us figure out whether the youth committee should report to the session or to the Christian ed committee. And they've had a big, they've been fighting over this issue as if that was the issue. Now, when that's your issue, you got issues. Yeah? Here's the second one. Um, enmeshed, anxious, serious fixing. We say, we got to do something. We got to, we can't, we can't wait. We got to, we got to go. We got to, we... the inability to step back and create a beat before we react, Right? That's going to keep us stuck. It's just going to tighten the knot in the rope. Here's, here's, a, here's a great example of that. Have you all seen this? So it's two churches across the street from each other, and uh, they start battling on their signs. So uh, the first one is the Catholic Church says, all dogs go to heaven. The Presbyterian Church says, only humans go to heaven. Read the Bible. <laughs> the Catholic Church says, God loves all his creatures, dogs included. But Presbyterian Church says, dogs don't have souls. This is not open for debate. <laughs> Next one says, Catholic dogs go to heaven. Presbyterian dog can talk to their pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and they're still in it. Still in it. Converting to Catholicism doesn't magically grant your dog a soul. <laughs> Free dog souls with conversion. <laughs> Now, if you're a pagan driving down the street, <laughs> who do you want to play with, right? Uh, we can be right and be very, very wrong. And the church, the Christian church, has a history of this. And the writer we are, the greater potential we have to destroy people, and uh, not just in a hilarious way, like, I mean, think the Crusades, Right? Um, there, are, there are things that we do when we are absolutely certain of our rightness that we would say right is right and wrong has no rights. Maybe we need to take a beat and say, how would Jesus respond in this situation with people who, with whom he disagrees vehemently? Here's the next one. Focusing on the identified patient rather than on the self. We talked about that yesterday, so all right, and even today. And then the last one is focusing on gathering more information or learning, learning the right techniques. Uh, what Friedman says in his book, Failure of Nerve, Leadership in the Age of the Quick Fix, which I mentioned yesterday, which I think is one of the best three books I've read in the last 10 years. Um, he says the trap for all of us in leadership is to think that the, the answer is learning how, more technique, and the answer is getting more data. Let's just get more information. That'll take care of it, right? Um, and he says, leadership, ultimately, you got to say, it's not necessarily about getting exactly the right method. It's not about getting more information. Somewhere we got to pull a decision. We got to pull forward and make a decision, right? Um, I'm going to, because we're moving forward, I, I, we may come back to that. But um, here, here are the top youth workers' pressure points, according to Link Institute, uh, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. They said, when I'm busy, I sacrifice my devotional times. My job demands are more than time allows. I feel the emotional strain of my work. Five, top five pressures. I regret not spending more time with youth who have dropped out. I have too little time for myself. What's the word that keeps coming up? Yeah. So um, if we're going to move to tending our hearts, it all starts with time. Um, remember, we've played with this. Traditional youth workers got it all on top of them. The sustainable youth worker is more like that. We're really looking at moving beyond being victims in ministry. Now, um, we, do a lot, we do a lot of coaching calls uh, in, our, in our work, and, and it's not unusual when we call for somebody to, to say, I say, well, how's it going? Give me the update. Man, it's been crazy. 
We had the week. We had the retreat this weekend, and then the, my, my kid had the flu, and the <laughs> and they kind of go through this thing. And, and there's sort of the surprise that that life is crazy. I've got a new I got a new sign thing that I say to myself when I'm feeling that way. I just say, "Ah, it's just stuff. It's just it's just a thing. It's just stuff." Um, I want you to take a quick look at this video and tell me any implications for ministry that you see. Thirty seconds with a partner. Implications for ministry. Go. Okay, I think you bubbled up some great stuff. Give me two or three things that you talked about in your group. What insights would you have that we can just kind of hear together? Come on. The easy way seems like it's working. Sometimes you just have to take the, the hard step. You go back to like, what are we doing? Biblical ministry. Let's just take that step. Let's just take that hard step. So, so the easy thing is just ride the escalator. Yeah, that's the easy step. Or, or the guy coming to fix you, right? That's the easy solution. Maybe just take the hard step. Great, yeah. so great yeah brilliant exactly yeah so we, we're used to doing things the the same way we expect I, I started out in ministry you could do a burger bash right and you could get you know a nice crowd of kids to come to eat burgers with you <laughs> we're not doing that anymore yeah oh so great yeah so it's it's i've built a system the system ought to work what's the problem here right um, and just saying, uh, we, we can't trust the system just to work automatically. Great, yeah. Oh, so great. So we're, we, we think the goal is to, to move up to the next story. Uh, or, or, or we just are trying to, the goal is maybe to get the, the escalator to work rather than to get to the next level. Yeah, absolutely, great. Okay, um, I want to introduce you to this thing we call the Rhythmic Week. Uh, in our coaching work, this is one of the first things we work with with a, with a client is we want to make sure that they put their week in some sort of order so that there's a little bit of a rhythm to it. Now, part of the reason we have a Sabbath uh, in one of the, one of the top, uh, uh, I, I, is it 12? 12 commandments? Because number, it's not about numbers, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, so, in, in the number four, right next to murder, right next to murder is the Sabbath. Now, the younger generation is a little better about taking the Sabbath than my generation. I mean, my generation, uh, ministers would be proud 
of saying, <laughs> a day off? <laughs> What's that? I haven't taken a day off in three years. <laughs> the devil doesn't take a day off. <laughs> I didn't think the devil was our role model. Thank you. <laughs> yeah? Um, Eugene Peterson says that to, to be a, a pastor who doesn't take a, a Sabbath is like being a banker who embezzles. It's being, it, it, to be proud of the fact that we don't put a, a break in our week where we, there's a stutter step, there's a recovery, there's a, a rest. Um, so, um, again, I, maybe you all do this, but I, I'm just suggesting you, we need a 24-hour period. Well, I'm, I'm really not suggesting, I'm actually commanding um, there's a 24-hour period in our, in our week, every week, when something is different. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to legislate what you do different, but it ought to be different. It ought to be rest. So there, in, on my Sabbath, my, all I do is I just don't get on the computer, and I don't answer email. That, that's, that's my big, I mean, I usually don't go in the office, and I don't, don't usually respond to phone calls, but my big deal is, you want to you want to create an interruption in your week? Don't get on the computer. It'll you you will be thinking about something different because you're you're like oh gee, I mean, or I mean for some of us a Sabbath from our, our cell phones would be I mean I, I don't think I I'm not spiritual enough to do that but some of you might be able to pull that out. <laughs> thinking about what what's the thing that will make your Sabbath day fundamentally different than every other day in the week, and you know if if you're a mom. It may be, I'm not going to do laundry on the Sabbath. That could be a huge thing for you. Um, but what, whatever, your, whatever your thing is, or not to say that men don't do laundry. Um, so um, the other thing we suggest is that, um, is that everybody needs six, six red slots in their week. And actually, I forgot to turn this one red. Um, now, I call this non-porous non-porous time off. What's the difference between porous and non-porous? Nothing gets in it. Porous is like a sponge, right? Yellow is porous time off. It's like, you know, if something comes up and I got to, last minute, I got to prepare my sermon, sure. Um, the red is stuff that you say, this is an appointment with the president. If somebody needs me, they'll have to call me after my visit at the White House. Um, so we suggest six slots every week, and actually, um, actually, we we built, we created this initially. Susan and I, actually, Susan created this for our marriage because she was feeling like she never saw me uh, because I was doing God's work all the time, and she, uh, well, there's more detail. So, <laughs> um, uh, and so we created this, and actually, um, in this book we wrote, uh, which is like a, a primer for the first year of marriage. The most important year of a woman's life, most important year of a man's life, huh? 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 Nice, huh? Huh? So if you're doing premarital counseling, what a great resource. So does anybody have somebody that you're doing premarital counseling with right now? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah? Okay, I'm throwing you this book. Throw this back. Ready? Watch out for your head. Here it comes. Oh, oh, easy. Oh, that's nice. Man, that was good. It's a little bit, it's a little bit damaged. It's a little bit damaged, but... Hope you enjoy it. Um, <laughs> uh, good. And you, your marriage is going to be blessed now <laughs> from, from that for sure. Um, but the idea is we create a little bit of this rhythm in our week, and this is not catch-up time. This is not like, oh, gee, I got meetings, 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 and then on Sabbath is when I'm going to finally catch up on my emails. This is, oh, I, I got to catch my breath. Um, Yellow is poorest time off. That's time when we're not in meetings um, and we could do stuff. If you want to join a bowling league, go crazy. Um, the orange is your programming time and then uh, the, the green is general admin time. The secret to your future. Uh, that's just penultimately under God's grace. The secret to your future is balcony time. Um, balcony time is is time when you work on your life, not in your life. 
It's when you are stepping into the balcony and you are, you're planning out your next week. You're figuring out what are my most important priorities. You're, you're looking at or writing your personal mission statement. You're figuring out who are the coaches that I want to meet with this week. Um, it's not a time to pray. It's a time to plan out your prayer life for the next week. When am I going to make time for God? It's not a time to exercise, but it is time to plan out your, when am I going to run or exercise, go to the Y this week? It's not a time to read, but it's a time to go, oh, I hadn't read a book in the last month. I got I to gotta at least do something. I'm just going to, it could just be the decision. I'm going to put a book on, on the back of my toilet and I, every time I'm going to at least read something, right? <laughs> Speaking of, uh, <laughs> um, any of you have a short attention span? Like any of you? Okay. This, this is, I call, we call this our toilet, toilet, toilet bowl youth ministry book. Um, <laughs> It's called The Indispensable Youth Pastor, and the, the idea is it's about three, three pages every chapter. So, um, so it just sort of is a, a, a quick chapter on some area of youth ministry that I would love for you to have, because you uh, have needs in the bathroom, for sure, <laughs> for, for sure. Um, so uh, we always say, both fig- figurative, figuratively and literally, the money is in the balcony. If you can make three hours a week for yourself and don't do it at the office, how come? You'll be interrupted. People will come in. Uh, So you're going to pick your balcony time, one slot, and and a slot here has a meal, and it's got at least three hours in it. So it's time you wake up till lunchtime, noon until 5 or so, and then 5. So if you've got a meeting until 6.30, it's yellow. It's not, it's not, um, it can't be red. Makes sense. Red means you got from five until bedtime to be, be with your family or whatever. Um, questions about the rhythmic week? Oh, let me tell you, there is this incredible book. Um, <laughs> um, well, there, there are a couple things. Um, it's in sustainable, um, so you can, you can get it in sustainable youth ministry. Or it's in, it's in the marriage book, or you can email me and I'll, I'll send you a copy or whatever. I can copy chapters out of Sustainable if you don't want to read the whole thing. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations to uh, uh, like some of the questions? Monday is off, and Friday is the game. Uh, yeah. Uh, what are your recommendations on the Sabbath for uh, if you've got a Monday off situation? Yeah, yeah. I just would move your Sabbath right over here, and then just make sure, you know, you got 21 slots here, and it's just, you're just going to move them around. So I just, I just would move it here. The, the thing I like about this, this particular rhythm is that, and it could work on a Monday, is that you're hitting it hard and then things fundamentally change on Thursday evening. And uh, so you've got from Thursday evening uh, until Sunday, Sunday afternoon, you've got uh, only one responsibility. So you're hitting it really hard here. And then we've got not just 24 hours, but we've got a nice, nice little space. So let's just say you do that over here. Well, then you, you keep your Saturday just like it is. So by the time you, maybe, yeah, after fr- you're, you're working, going to games on Friday, but then you do your Saturday, go to Sunday, but then you're going to have to find some other, just make sure you got six is the idea. Yeah. Um, this, uh, working this process uh, is, it can be so liberating and it can be unnerving. Um, because most weeks don't fit neatly into a rhythm. <laughs> most weeks there's craziness. But you know where you work on that? Balcony time. When you're in balcony time, you're looking at next week and you're going, oh, dang, I can't take a Sabbath day on Thursday or Monday. I got to do so-and-so. Yeah? Great. It's all, it's all in the green time. You're doing everything on your normal task list in the green time. Or you can do it in your programming, after programming, before programming. You're just not touching, or you can even do it in yellow time. You're just not touching that red time or the balcony time. So your whole, what you're trying to do is cram your task list into these seven slots. That's your, that's your magic. Um, work always expands to fill the amount of time you allot for it. So if you give it, Here's a, here's a little trick that I play, and most people, this drives them crazy, but when I'm doing a wedding or a funeral, I don't start preparing until two hours before. 
Because you know what I'll do? I'll be done in two hours. <laughs> and it's a, it's, there's a lot of adrenaline that goes in that two hours, but I'm not wasting any time. If I give myself eight hours to prepare for a wedding, you know how long it's going to take me? Eight, eight hours. hours. So anyway, um, other questions about Rhythmic Week? This could rock your world. Just saying. Um, yeah. Oh, no, you can have it whenever. I typically, you know, most people, and me included, put it toward the end of the week. So I would, I would tend to do, you know, a balcony time, get all my work done by Thursday morning and go do balcony time here, and then it sends me into the weekend rested. Um, but yeah, you can throw it anywhere. G generally, you want to do balcony time when you got energy. And so if you're a morning person, do it morning. Um, I stay up all the way till 8 o'clock sometimes at night. <laughs> I'm a wild man like that. Um, okay, and here's the, here's the, I love this line from Victor Hugo, whom I'm sure you guys love. Um, he who every morning plans the transaction of the day and follows out that plan carries a thread that will guide him through the labyrinth of the most busy life. But where no plan is laid, where the disposal of time is surrendered merely to the chance of incident, Chaos will soon reign. This is the story of our lives, y'all. And But so starting the day with a nice 20 minutes of, okay, what am I going to do today? Um, I've been doing a thing lately called habit stacking. So I've got, I got a set of habits that I try to spend five minutes or less on every day. Things, even, things like drinking, a, I, I want to drink uh, 12 ounces of water. That's going to happen first thing in the morning. I want to, uh, I want to do my mileage. Y'all ever, ever have to turn in your mileage for church and you look back over the last, and you figure, I, I have no idea what I did, but I know I do my receipts. I want, to, I want to read a little bit. I want to have my quiet time. All, all those things, but they're just all uh, begun at the beginning of the day. Um, <laughs> I just love that picture. <laughs> Wouldn't you want these guys to be your coaches? I sure would, for sure. Well, um, the, the, the idea is... Um, as I said, most of us don't do the work of building coaches in our lives. I want to suggest you need, I, 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 you can count them. Here we go. You need a marriage coach. If you're married, <laughs> you, need, you need a coach to help you keep your marriage above a 95 on, on a scale of 1 to 100. Um, when your marriage gets below a, a, an 80, it's Herculean work to get it out, and it takes so much more work. Keeping your, work above an, keeping your marriage above a 95 takes hardly any work at all. Susan and I would say we spend almost zero effort keeping our marriage healthy these days because it's always up there at a buoyant kind of 95, and we're, and we're working on it. And actually, we're, we're playing with the idea of writing a book called Stop Working on Your Marriage. Um, the whole idea being that it's this sort of getting serious that makes us not really have many threads of, uh, of, of intimacy that can hold us together, hold up a good argument. But when there's plenty of buoyancy, there's plenty of money in, you know, Gary Chapman's love bank, um, we're able to do it. So a marriage, a marriage coach. I'm thinking you need a ministry coach. Um, it can be somebody across town that's got some years on them. It can be something formal like hiring a coach with Ministry Architects or some other consulting organization. But having a ministry coach that just looks at your stuff, it just... It's only for champions. But if you want to do something exceptional in ministry, you need a ministry coach. Uh, you need an emotional coach. Now, I know guys don't have emotions. But you need a coach that can help you navigate all the sort of rumblings that we are in illusion about. And um, so about three years ago, as I was beginning this discernment process about what the next chapter was, I started going to a counselor, probably the... Uh, Susan would say, uh, the most expensive, best money we've ever spent. There's just something about uh, having somebody that's tending to your heart uh, and helping you do that. Um, most of us have insurance that will pay for that. And the great thing is, they don't even have to be great counselors. Just having, just having somebody makes a difference. Uh, you need a spiritual director of some kind. Uh, it's not the same as the emotional coach. This is... And, 
hear me, I'm not saying meet with these folks every week. Some of them you only meet once a year. It's okay. Uh, but, but a spiritual director that you're meeting with and trying to, uh, trying to tend to the rhythms of God in your own life and the, what's the next thing God is stirring and what's this unsettledness about, you need a financial coach. Most people in church say this ridiculous statement, I don't do money. No, you do do money. Actually, <laughs> I just said doo-doo. You, uh, no, you, 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 <clears throat> you, you have to deal with your money. You can do it poorly or well, but you're going to deal with money. So our financial coach, we meet with once a year, and he you know, gives us a trajectory for the year, and we work that plan for the year. Um, there are plenty of people that would love to do that for free for you because if they're good, they make you rich, and then they, have, they get to invest all your money, right? Because they help you figure out how to, how to save and all that stuff. So a financial coach. Um, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just suggesting, I want you to, if, if you left here and got nothing else, having a play, ha, making the decision that I'm going to get one more coach in my life this next year, I think is a game changer. And for youth workers to begin to do that puts us on a whole different conveyor belt than what normal people do. Because it's just a very small percentage of people that, that will spend time or money on coaches. Um, questions about either of those things? Balcony week or coaches? We good? I sold you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, say more about that. Sure, sure, yeah, if, if, it, if it does, I mean, if, if it's working for you, sure. Um, generally, uh, coaches help us, um, uh, this is a crass way of saying it, coaches help me with Mark DeVries Incorporated, and so Mark DeVries the minister, Mark DeVries the husband, Mark DeVries the father, so uh, if the church has an agenda of helping you, you know, get with the program in the church, that may be a little different than sort of, you know, your life management. And so, but if it works, absolutely. It's free and they provide it. Awesome. Sing the doxology. And also, can, can a coach overlap in different areas? Because there's a, there's a lot of people that are really good at different things. Like, they're really good at ministry and No, I mean, yeah, and, and all of this, thank you for, for honoring me as if I know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, in, in all of these things, you're, you're just trying to uh, be faithful in stewarding this instrument God's giving you of your, of your life. And if you feel like, you know, this guy's putting enough tension on the string I don't really need anymore, great. But, yeah, don't mess up. <laughs> don't mess, well, yeah, I'm, yeah, I, I, I got good news for you. <laughs> You've already screwed it up. It's, it's, we all have, right? Um, okay. Um, we are now at the point of, uh, we're going to move toward this uh, $100 bet. It is, uh, it's now 10.08. We've got 52 minutes. So um, here's, here's the deal. Uh, I'd love for you to take, we'll take a brief break. Let's take a five-minute break. And then we're going to come back and um, we're going to dive into this $100 bet. If you want to um, if you want to fill out this form on my iPad or on my phone, or you want to use this link, feel free to do that. But I'll see you back in five minutes. What I love to do with kids is we, we take uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, the great cloud of witnesses, the arena, essentially the Olympic arena. And we have kids draw this arena. Here's the track. The kids are running. You know, there's a, kids running on the track, right? And we put... Uh, we, we say to kids, I want you to populate your arena. Who you got up there cheering for you? Who's in there for you? I mean, it wouldn't be a bad exercise for us to do right now for ourselves. But so I would say um, when, I was in, when I was in high school, George and Trish Holland, my pastor and his wife, uh, they were on the front row. My mom, my dad weren't speaking to each other, but they were uh, there cheering for me. Um, you know, I, I had read a little bit of, uh, I read Basic Christianity by John Stott. So John Stott was over here. Um, uh, let's see, I had an uncle, had my Uncle Gene over here. 
and my, of course, my, my dad has two brothers who are pastors, and so they're, Larry and Cal uh, were over here. And, uh, you know, I knew about Martin Luther King, uh, and there's Billy Graham, he was over here. Um, you get the idea? We're saying to kids, populate your arena for yourself. Uh, so I was talking with someone yesterday, and I said, who, okay, so who's, who, who takes responsibility for doing this? And so my answer is, you start with the kids. We want kids to have the orientation that they're going to pursue mentors, spiritual mentors, when they leave, leave high school. That they're just going to naturally seek those people out. One of the things I was so proud of my kids about when they got married, both Debbie and Adam pursued, they probably had 15 breakfasts or lunch or dinners with, with older couples as marriage mentors. And they just said, tell me the secret. What do you all fight about? How does this work? How does that work? And so the whole notion of when kids feel like they have agency, when they feel like they have power, that's when it starts going. They say, I'm going to seek after somebody who's going to help me really grow in my faith. <sighs> awesome. Now, in addition to the kids, it's the parents' job. The only thing I did right with Lee was making sure she was surrounded by incredible adults. And we'd have people over for dinner, and they would, it was awesome. So we'd have people over for dinner, and we'd be having fun. And we'd, we'd have the kids' table and the adult table. We weren't saying, hey, honey, we're going to have some intergenerational time for you to be invested in by a mentor who could really change your life. No, well, the kids' table and adults' table, and we're having fun in here. Well, all of a sudden, when we're having fun, what do the kids do? <laughs> hey, uh, what are y'all doing? Oh, nothing. Just oh, just old people stuff. You don't. You probably wouldn't care. Awesome. Can I, can I just can I just sit here? Okay. All right. Um, so so given parents, we we call it stacking the stands. I think the most profound thing parents can do for their teenage kids in these adolescent years is to stack the stands. Don't worry about learning the perfect parenting technique or, or, or doing it exactly right in terms of, you know, I believe in all that logical, natural consequences stuff. But if, you, if we can create this larger ecology, that it's a grace space that fills in the gaps of our certain failure. This whole business of, of the responsibility for parenting being all on the mom and dad, I just, I, I, it, is, it is an American aberration. Remember when Jesus went to the temple at 12 years old? His parents didn't see him for a full, like the full day of travel. They're setting up camp on the way back, setting up camp. Mary says, Joe, have, have you seen the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world? <laughs> and Joseph says, no, I don't know where the Alpha and the Omega is. I've been looking for him. And it's a whole like 12 hours. Now listen, if I'm traveling from Nashville to Texas, and I see Adam at the McDonald's in Nashville, and then I finally get to Texas, and I say, hey, I wonder where that kid is. Um, I would be arrested. <laughs> because the biblical model just assumes it's not just mom and dad. I, got, I hear a lot of this language about biblical family. We need to have a biblical family. You want to have a biblical family, I, I told the group yesterday, bring your mother-in-law in to live with you. Bring your cousins, get them all in the same house with you. You can have a biblical family. But until then, quit calling everybody else non-biblical, right? Um, sorry, I kind of went to preaching there for a second. Um, uh, so what we're looking for is, is when our kids are surrounded by this web, the need for perfection and excellence in parenting and getting it right the sort of obsession with getting it right, which actually can mess our kids up just as well as getting it wrong, right? I mean, many of you have been to therapy about such things. Um, our obsession with getting it right can often do just the opposite of creating a place where kids are opened up to the work of the Spirit of God. So uh, just, just suggesting, uh, see if there's a way you can, you can surround your kids. Now, thirdly, it's the kids, it's the parents, but it's also the youth pastor, the youth ministry. You want to create excuses for kids to connect with godly adults. Maybe it's a pair partner program. Maybe it's an adopt-a-grandparent program. Maybe it's you have your kids praying for uh, the elders in the church, and every elder has a secret prayer partner of a teenager, and at the end of the year, the great reveal comes, and they say, hey, I've been praying for you all year. Yeah? 
so there are all kind of, there are all kind of uh, ways that we can do that. But it starts with kids, then we inspire parents to do it, and then we do it as a ministry. Again, it doesn't all upside down pyramid on the youth pastor. It can, it can be a thing that we invite and catalyze as part of our culture and our ministry. Um, okay, um, come on. That's a great one. Huh. Okay, here we go. You ready for the $100 bet? It's time. Y'all are saying, how can you, how can you be taking so long? Um, okay, here we go. The first thing you're going to do um, is you're going you're gonna to decide the, a, a couple uh, caveats in this bet. You have to spend at least two hours a week on this if you want all the volunteers you want. Time usually equals results. And if you're not spending the time, it's not going to happen. But if you want volunteers, you spend two hours a week for six months, I, I, I'm betting you $100 you're going to have it. The first step is you... You choose to invest in partners, not helpers. Now, my mom dies, and you come to visit me, and um, I've got little kids in the house. If you're a helper, what do you say on your way out the door? Call me if you need me. Who's got the responsibility to take the next step? I do, right? The grieving son who's exhausted and has got to take care of all these kids. Call me if you need me. That's a helper. Now, we all need helpers. But most youth pastors organize their ministries with the genius and the million helpers model, which means every time some, you need something, you've got to re-recruit that person to do that thing. If you come to my house after grieving and, and you're a partner, what do you say? You're walking out the door. What do you say? I'll call you tomorrow. What, what other kinds of things could you say? Some of you have been through this and people have done this for you. What'd they do? How can I support you? That's a good question, yeah? I got, the kids, I got the kids on Saturday. Don't worry about it. I got meals organized for the next two weeks. I'm going to handle rides for the kids to school for the next, right? A partner takes load-bearing work and does that work without you having to ask them again. When you're, uh, when you're recruiting helpers, they're just waiting around for you to give them a job. And the very helper who says, hey, call me anytime you need something, when you need them... Oh, gee, I'm sorry, I'm going to be in snow mass. I can't really, right? So you're going to build your partner team. When your partner can't show up to do his or her job, what does he do or she? They get their replacement. Oh, it's so fabulous. Okay, here we go. Um, the first thing is you're going to identify your needs. Um, and the first five steps here are the steps most people ignore. <laughs> it's just the first five out of six. Um, the first, first step is your needs. So these are all your partner needs. Let me give you some examples. I need small group leaders. So I'm going to need 7th, 8th grade boys. I'm going to need 7th, 8th grade girls. I'm going to need high school boys, high school girls, and I need two each. All right. Then I need Sunday school teachers. I need a junior high. I need three of those. I need high school. I need three of those. Now I've got these big events. I want to I wanna have a coordinator that actually manages all the details of those events because uh, it, it's a good idea to have an organized person organizing. And I am not an organized person. I spent the first 10 years of my ministry being criticized by organized people for not being organized. Once I realized maybe I could recruit somebody organized to be organized, it, it took a lot of pressure off, right? Major event coordinators, they just manage, they just manage a, an individual event. So it's the crud day or it's the fall kickoff event or the chili cook-off or whatever it happens to be. So you just name your events here. You know, you might have a food coordinator that makes sure you've always got food for a youth group. You might have a transportation coordinator that always gets rides when you, whatever. You might have a decorations person that every time you have an event, they do decorations or set up or clean up. You, these, are, these are people that are in place. So, so part of what we've done, we only recruit publicly, like at our fall kickoff, we give a survey and say, where would you like to help? We've already recruited all of our partners. But at fall kickoff, we give them a survey and say, would you like to help with the decorations, the setup, the food, the cleanup, the uh, photography, uh, you know, those kind of things. So there's a team of, you know, five to ten parents saying, I'll help with that. And then there's a coordinator. So when it's time for the event, the coordinator of the event calls the head of each of these areas and say, hey, can you take care of our food stuff? And that person, you know, all of this is much more magical uh, as I say it out loud than it really happens. Right, but 
Uh, but you get the idea. So we're, we're, you're naming your partner. So here we got eight, four, that's 12. So let's call this 20, all right? We need, we need 20 volunteers. Um, questions about the needs list? Feel like you could create your partner needs list? Every ministry is going to be a little different. Yeah? You got a little fuzzy face. Oh, so glad you raised that. Um, so the idea is you are going to provide what is inside the frame. So you're not asking them to find the speaker, to organize the small groups, to create the program, to launch the music, any of that stuff. But you are asking them to do the bulletin board. You are asking them to do registration. You are asking them to reserve the vans. Um, and um, yeah, it's a culture shift. And there will be people in your church. Here's how you know you're doing it right. If they say, I thought that was your job, you're doing it right. <laughs> yeah. You, you don't, but you, you don't want to engage that with a lot of words. Like, let me give you six reasons why this works. Because I went to the seminar and this guy, uh, he told me that we should do this. And everybody says, here's a book. He wrote this book. You just want to say, um, yeah, I mean, part of what we're trying to do is expand our base. And uh, yeah, I'm happy for anything you'd like to be involved in. Don't engage. When the bull is running at you, you don't slug the bull. You wave your flag and let it run past. Pat it on the bottom while it's going past. <laughs> In line with safe sanctuary guidelines. Always, okay? So, but a lot of times we feel like we've got to give an answer to that kind of nonsense, and you're not going to convince them. So don't feel like you've got to convince them. Just go recruit somebody who will do it. Um, but, Yeah. Oh, you're so fabulous. At, no, at this step, all you're doing is making your list with blanks. Yeah? You feel better about that? Step one, everybody feel like you could pull this off? Great. Okay. The next thing is um, you're going to create your pool. So the pool equals three times your needs. So if you need 20, how many names do you need on your pool list? Okay. So we got to come up with we got to come up with 60 names on your pool list. You may say, "I don't even know if I know 60 people in the church." Well, then you're going to have to go find them. <laughs> um, there's a thing called sourcing, and the way you source is you go to other people. So you make the list of everybody you might want to recruit, and then you go to your pastor and you say, "Who do you think might have gifts for ministry here?" Then you go to your colleagues on staff, "Who do you think might be great with kids?" You go to the kids, ask them, who in the church would you like to see work, work with our youth ministry? You go to the parents. You go to anybody who's well-connected in the church to you grow this thing up to 60. How many phone calls have you made at this point? Zero. Please, 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 do not assault people in the parking lot when you are... Uh, usually we have one really sort of fiery need that we need, and we think, I'm not going to call them because I might get them at a, a bad time. I'm going to uh, just catch them when I see them and they're on their way to the car ready to go to lunch and you go you know we're really desperate everybody has said no I've gotten all the good people I've asked them and I'm down to you could you <laughs> right um, so you're just going to come up with this list of 60 we jiggy questions okay then then you're going to rank the list of 60 this is fun but you don't want to leave this out on your desk yeah Kirk <laughs> Thank you. I didn't say that right. That's I call that a pedophile invitation. Uh, yeah. So if if you want the person you don't want, put it in the bulletin. The only person that's going to sign up at that point is the person uh, that is. Um, that is not doing something already. Now, most people in the church that you want already have taken initiative and they're doing so, they're serving in some way. Uh, but if you've got somebody who's been kicked off of every other committee and they see the need to change the lives of young, young minds and really uh, sort of uh, assault them with their brilliance, those people will sign up. So yeah, I, 
we never, we always say, please don't put it out there in, the, in worship. Because it telescopes to the congregation, there is no leader in the youth ministry. When there's a leader, the leader has the team. Seldom does the coach of the Seahawks put something in the newspaper and say, please, I wonder, would anybody like to be on our team? <laughs> championship coaches find championship players. And if you're going to be the coach, you've got to go find your team. You, you don't, if you want ducks, try to catch them all at one time. If you want eagles, you've got to go after them one at a time. And most of the time, we think, oh, I'm going to save so much time by sending this group email to 70 people and inviting them all at one time. Never works. When I get a group email, I know they don't need me. If somebody call, here, I'm just going to preach here for a second. If, if you call me and say, do you, you want to, can you bring a half a dozen cookies to youth group Sunday night? I'd say, I don't have time. If you call me and say, could you help us redesign the way we think about young adult ministry in the church? It's a big job and it, it could take three years. I might be really interested. A lot of times, the reason people say no is not because they're not committed, but because they have much more to give and they don't want to waste their time making chili when they really feel called to do something else. Not that chili is a problem. Um, so here's, here's, our, here's our rank. You got an ABC rank and you got a web rank. All right? Now ABC is just like an A is, a, is an A player. They're, they're a franchise player. You want to keep them. A B is, that'd be pretty good. A C is only in a pinch. Okay? So you're going to rank, rank your people A, B, or C. And then you're going to rank them with a web ranking. Now, web ranking is with kids, W. B is behind the scenes, or E is either one. So certain people can't organize their way of a paper bag, but they'd be great just leading kids. You put them in front of kids, they're going to do awesome, but you've got to organize everything else for them. Behind the scenes person, there are certain people that kids, uh, kids would say, please, please, please don't let my mom come on the trip. Please, please, please don't let, have my mom be a leader. Well, that mom wants to be involved, but she can organize an event, do something behind the scenes. Um, or either one, some people would be great at both. So um, you're just giving everybody, you know, a W, an E, a B, something. Uh, you with me on that? That's, that's the rank. Uh, either one. So with kids, behind the scenes, or either one. Then you do the rank. Then you're going to do the match. So you've got your list here. And so you, you, you take these two lists, your needs list with the blanks, your pool list here that's been ranked, and you're going to start filling in blanks. So I need a small group leader to work with my junior high boys. What am I looking for over here? An A and a W, or an A and an E, right? I'm going to go through, ah, that may not be the one. I'll go, oh, then, okay, that one might work, and you drop it in the list. How many phone calls have we made? Zero calls. So we're going to just drop all those names. We're going to fill all 20 slots with a name. It's sort of our dream team. This is our first round draft picks. Okay, these are the things nobody ever does, and it's the reason why we have so much trouble recruiting. Here's the next one. You're going to make the calls or send an email. Typically, the first call sounds something like this. Um, hey, I'm putting together my team for my seventh grade boys, and I would love for you to be a part of that team. If you're a no or a maybe, would you just let me know? Um, and I'll, if you're a maybe, let's get together and have some coffee. We'll talk about it. Um, it's just a quick qualifier, a quick um, they can say no easily to that email. When they say no, um, well, you're going to work the follow-up process, step six. So when somebody says no, you drop them down to the no list. You send them a nice email and you say, thanks so much for getting back to me. Um, I just know that you're one of the few people in the church that has gifts for working with kids. And so I'm going to come back in six months and ask you again. And I'm sure you'll say yes eventually. <laughs> Have a nice day, right? Um, in, in the book that we've got out here, the, the Building Your Volunteer Team book, we actually give you, uh, we give you uh, eight, eight different emails that you can send. Why do we give you eight? Because they will ignore seven of them. <laughs> when, when they don't call you back, you're not going to be like a normal youth pastor who whines about it. You're going to go, oh, that's just the way it works. I've got a whole pocket full of emails I'm about to send right? And so by the time you get eight weeks into this thing and they finally respond, what's the first thing they say? I'm so sorry that I have taken so long to get back to you. And you say, hey, no worries. Grace to you. 
Absolute, you know, just, I just want to, you know, grace abounds here. Uh, would you like to work with the seventh grade boys? Chances are, you know, we're counting on two-thirds of them saying no. When they say no, you're not freaking out because you still got your list of another 40 names here. When they say no, you're going to let them know, I'm coming back in, in uh, six months. You're dropping them down to the no list. You're putting another name in the list. And every week, you're coming back to make the same, same calls, same phone call, same emails, text, whatever you want to do. But make it simple. You're not, a, a lot of times, what we do is when somebody has even, when we have somebody's name, we say, hey, can we get together for lunch? And then you have a lunch and it takes about six weeks to plan the lunch. And then you finally have the lunch. And you bring like a six-page job description in a really nice slick folder. And you lay it on them and you say, here's the, here's the... And they were a no before you ever asked. You only want to meet with the maybes. And once you've got the maybes, that's when you're going to bring the job description. And once you have the meeting, you're going to say, here's kind of what we're looking for. And some people are going to say, I would rather be a helper than a partner. This is not a job I can do, but what I can do is be a sub or put me down on that list to help with. Uh -huh. Eventually, I'd like to be a, right. Okay, questions about the $100 bet process? Yeah. Um, um, this, is, this is what Harvard professor uh, Ron Heifetz would call an adaptive leadership challenge. <laughs> um, there, is, uh, there are two kind of leadership challenges. One is the technical challenge, which is here are the three steps to get you through it. The adaptive leadership challenge is much more complex. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's, there are a lot of trade-offs. I mean, this is a great case study and sort of leading your volunteer team. And you, you, you may be willing to have him, you know, being a little bit of a downer in a small group if you get him to run your whole mission trip, right? Um, and so um, you just, you want to move toward incredibly, an incredibly excellent uh, team that's well aligned. And you're just going to, you know, the bottom line is you're hearing me say there's not an answer to that. Um, you're just, but... There, there, is a, uh, there is the trajectory. You're going to move toward this team being more and more that way. And, and it, it may be that you have a conversation with them and saying, let me tell you where I really need you is over here. And then you, let's just say he is the leader for the seventh grade boys in a small group. Well, you just say, here's what I want to do. I really want to recruit some other folks to help you in that group. And I want you to sort of, I want you to more invest in the other leaders and let those, lead, you know, there are all kinds of ways to play it, none of which will work. Remember, Mark 17, 1. It, it, will, it won't, but, but failing in the right direction works. Dumb persistence, just hang in there. But, I, yeah, no answer. Nothing. I, I talked for a long time saying nothing, didn't I? It was, sounds like a sermon. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just letting them marinate in the glory of knowing that they were wanted. Uh, but, you know, generally I, I'm, not, I'm not working that process at all. Just, uh, but I have, I have telescope to them. I'm coming after them later on. Yeah. Hypothetically. Yeah. Yeah. Great. What, what you're going to want to do is, is do the, the sort of behind-the-scenes digging with wherever you got the name from. Uh, 
So if you got it from the senior pastor, saying, I'm trying to figure out, what kind of, are they an A player? Are they, are they better behind the scenes? What, what would you think? And you're going to kind of trust them. Oh, it's, I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, you can play that all kind of ways, but my recommendation is Philippians 2. We're not going to think only of our own interest, right? And so we're going to, I always say when I'm recruiting a new class of seventh grade leaders, I call the children's director and I say, here's the list of all the parents of the rising seventh graders. Who are the ones you want me to leave alone? She has absolute power to tell me not to go after those because she's got them involved and I, get, I go after everybody else. Now, you can play it however you want, but I, I, I find that that creates, it, it gives us much more position of power, and we're not, uh, we're not in the, the recruiting war. Yeah. One more question, and then we'll, we're going to land the jet. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so what's going to happen is when you get a maybe, I mean, some people will actually say yes, like 20% will say yes without you even meeting with them, and you can email them a job description. Some of them will want to meet with you. And part of the reason, let's be honest, part of the reason people will say yes to you is because they want to work with you. And so the, part of the gift is you just investing in their life and drinking coffee with them and hearing about their family and their soul and what's going on. So you're going to bring at that coffee meeting, you're going to bring the job description to that coffee meeting. And some, a lot of times there's negotiation about, yeah, I can do this, but I can't do that. And then you've got to figure out at what point do they drop so many things off of the list that they are now a helper and not a partner. Um, well, friends, um, there are so many things that we could uh, talk about, and I'm uh, cognizant of the fact that y'all are about to jump on airplanes. Um, so I, but I do have a couple more gifts to give. Um, this is a new little resource that we're, uh, <laughs> we don't know if it'll work, but we, we're, we're kind of excited about it. Um, our experience with youth leader, so we've been just talking about recruiting. Our experience with, with youth leader training is we used to be able to get leaders to come to meetings. But generally, when we have regular youth leader meetings, we'll get about 25 to 30 percent of our leaders coming to meetings. And so there's just not much opportunity to download to them just sort of basic understanding of what youth ministry is. So um, youth leader training on the go is designed for a point youth pastor. So you, you pop this little CD or whatever, a DV, or whatever it is. You pop it into your computer. It's got, it's got 12 emails, and inside every email is embedded a video. And so you get to hear me or Jeff Dunrankin or uh, Melissa Rao, and we talk about the basics of relational youth ministry. We talk about, um, you know, how to help a kid in crisis. And so there are these 24 sessions like that. The, the beauty is the videos are no more than five minutes. You may say, how am I going to know if they ever watch that video? Well, they have to respond back to you with questions. And you, they're simple questions like, what color was Mark's shirt? Um, and uh, it's, you know, some of them are more meaningful. Um, it's hard to get much more meaningful than that. But they, um, they respond back to you with questions and there's a space in the email for you just to drop in. So if you're doing this every month, you're dropping in. This next month, here's what's coming up. Um, and here's where I need you if you got questions about so-and-so. So it keeps you, keeps you in touch with your volunteers, and you're doing a little training at the same time. We try to say it's going to take your volunteers less than 10 minutes uh, to kind of walk through this process and respond. Um, anyway, it, we got a few of these that we've dropped out there. But I'd love to, to give this to somebody. Oh, you want this guy? Okay, here it goes. Oh, watch your, watch your head there, baby. Okay. And because you caught it so well, I'll give you that one to you. Um, okay. And then I have this other book that whoever catches it can have it. Um, um, okay. Um, so I uh, want to wrap up with a quick video, and then we're going to pray. And then, uh, Joey, do, we have, do you do anything before we land the jet? You're going to come? Okay. So while the video is about to happen, I'm going to have you come this way. Um, come on. Here we go. This man right here is my great-grandfather. He's the first chapter in our family. Turn the jets. Don't let anybody tell you, please. <laughs> 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 
Lord, we thank you for the sweet gift of this week together, for time apart, for the chance to press the pause button. Lord, it's our heart's desire that we be wide open to what it is you want to do through us. Lord, we are so grateful that you have made us, that we come alive when we do the things you called us to do. So thank you for the chance to do that. Thank you for partners in ministry that we can walk with together. And we love you. Grateful for the extravagant gift of time apart together. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, brother.